No, I don't need nobody. I got me. So when I go out there, I'm always talking to myself. The reason why I'm talking to myself is because I got a plan. I know what the coverage is. I know how this linebacker plays. I know how I want to run this route against somebody. So I ain't got time to be able to show people I got that dog in me or that aggressive mentality in me because I, I've already studied the game and played the game before we even played. My coach in high school said, I don't see you being um, a top division one player. You may be a mid-major guy. This is my head coach telling me this. We won the Super Bowl when we, when we got on the Seahawks. We won a Super Bowl when Pete decided to become a coach. When you start looking at it, make Super Bowl decisions every single day. So when you get to the Super Bowl, it's just another game. We watched his interviews over the years at the Seahawks. Tyler the type, you asked him a question, he walked all the way around. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, no. We want direct, clear, and concise. Oh, so you want me like your retirement? You want me crying? This, oh, <laughs> this dude, this dude. Oh, <laughs> hey, once once your time comes, you, you can be there. Once your time comes, you'll be the same way. Hey, I, I didn't even cry on my wedding. Oh. <laughs> hey, I didn't either. Speaking but, of, speaking of wedding, speaking of, for first of all, is uh, this you're in KJ's house? Uh, this your first time over here? Uh, for sure. For some reason. Hmm, interesting. So, so I want to get into something. So, is it normal to invite someone to your wedding that you've never been to their house? That's kind of crazy now that you think about it. You've never, I mean, like, KJ, you don't invite nobody to your house, and then you wonder why nobody invites you to their wedding. So, why did you invite KJ to your wedding? I mean, I still consider KJ a brother, you know, <laughs> even though I wasn't invited to his party that he had here in the basement. I remember that Dang. one, but I mean, you know, sometimes good friends let stuff go. I like to see, I like that I'm a good dude, but I be doing some 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 shady stuff, man. Yeah, I mean, it's only shady when you look back. He, he didn't even invite <laughs> me to his fantasy football. Like somebody <laughs> came up the other day, was like, "Oh, KJ, I can't wait. What time at your house?" And I'm standing there like, "Wow, <laughs> you do some shady stuff." Do you KJ? play fantasy football, G? Everybody loves KJ, which they should. He is the nicest guy in the world. But, bro, you be low-key kind of ruthless sometimes. Do you play Fantasy G? No. Thank you. All right. <laughs> hey, so we got a very special guest, my dog, Tyler Lockett. Nine year? Nine years. Bro, you look like you like 21. How you? Hey, bro. Because he I got look. a Space Jam hat on. <laughs> and I'm bald. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Hey, so first of all, thank you for joining us, brother. Hey, the first thing we're going to do, welcome to KJ's Corner. Mm. Money Mike, welcome, welcome Tyler into KJ's corner. So, brother, okay. you are the master. First of all, you are a hell of a receiver. You are the master when it comes to the toe drag swag. Yeah. Give Nate Burleson his credit. Shout out Nate Burleson, because yes. that's his uh moniker, toe drag yes, swag. Yes, yes. And so walk us into the mindset of an offense when they're in the red zone. We're in the red zone, we're on the five-yard line, 12 personnel. Tell me what an offense is thinking right here. And what are you thinking? When you hear that, oh, they calling my number to execute this touchdown. Yeah, well, I mean, the biggest thing is we're talking about what's the down and distance, if it's first down, second or third. And for us, if we're not able to run the ball, then we want to be able to find some of our best monumental plays uh, right here. I mean, honestly, we've ran this play um, a numerous amount of times, and it's not only me getting the ball, but anybody's available to be able to get it. So uh, let me stop you right there. Why would an offense like, hey, Noah, start from here and go from the right to the left? Why yeah. would Noah just line up to the left? Uh, sometimes what we call it is you go to school. So you go to school and you want to be able to figure out if it's man or zone. Sometimes, mm. you know, sometimes like a linebacker or a safety, if they run across, then you know like, okay, they got them in man. If you see the defense end up shifting and one person goes to the right, the other person jumps over, yep. then you already know that it's a zone coverage too. Okay. But with Noah running across, we already know his zone. so Because nobody goes with him. Nobody no, goes with him. So we can either um, go to a different play or we can be able to run the same play if we feel comfortable running it. We ended up staying on. And at this mm -hmm. point, you got defenders whose eyes are either on the quarterbacks or trying to figure out the pattern reads and they just got lost. I got lost in the mix. Okay. Right now, before the ball is snapped, where are your eyes at when the ball is snapped? 
Uh, well, I mean, besides me watching the ball, I'm looking at safeties, linebackers, and then I'm looking at number 24, mm -hmm. uh, this cornerback, trying to figure out if he's going to run across the field with me or if he's just going to sit back and play his own. Once I feel like he's playing his own, then my eyes go to the the safety, trying to figure out is the safety going to be running with me or not. If he's mm -hmm. not running with me, then I already know that the person that I have to beat is either the other safety or the other corner. But once, if you keep it going, mm -hmm. you can be able to see that the corner sees Noah. Boom. If that corner doesn't take Noah and he takes me, Noah's open for the touchdown. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, all right. I'm only I'm going to speak from the fans' perspective, and since I got both an offensive person and a defensive person here, you guys can help me out with something. Now, everything that you just said, Tyler, I understand. And you just said that if the linebacker, uh, if he sits there basically in zone, Stop right there. KJ, mm -hmm. you're a linebacker. You were a linebacker right here. What happens right here? What is supposed <clears throat> to happen? Because Tyler comes across the middle right there. What should that linebacker do? So first of all, when you're in zone coverage in the field and when you're in zone coverage in the red zone, it's two different type of zone coverages. When you're in the red zone, it is matchup. Matchup right here, right now. If a guy in my vicinity, I got to take this guy and I got to buy this guy. If we're out in the field, we can zone. I could QB key, pass guys off. Right now, if I don't latch on a Tyler, this will be the result. It will be a touchdown. So his eyes are still on Geno, and he should have automatically took his eyes off Geno and went right to Tyler? This is not the type of party. Your eyes need to be on who's coming in my area. So if I see a Tyler and I see him coming, latch on to him. Like, you're not going anywhere. You are my man. If, I can, if I'm in the field, like, hey, pass off. Hey, here he comes, here he comes. You got to match up when you're in the red zone. And so when you keep when you keep the play going, we call this on defense a big wheel. What do you what do y'all call this concept on offense when you get past this defender and you go back to the in the back of the end zone? Well, I mean, when you're we're talking about throwing it to the back pylon, I mean, uh Gino has many different ways to be able to throw it. He could have threw me on to the NFL logo if he wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it just kind of depends because the linebackers always keying in on Gino. Gino knows that there's nobody back there to be able to throw me that ball. Mm -hmm. So it's either a, a me catching the ball or no one catches the ball. So that's kind of like how we put it. We have different spots and areas that we throw to mm -hmm. when it comes to the red zone. But, you know, the other thing too is if you go back, you're looking at Gino and you bring up a good point. If that linebacker ends up looking at me and taking me, you see what Homer does. He grabs both of them. Ooh. If Gino wanted to step up and run, he steps up and runs for the touchdown. Ooh. So either way, okay. I mean, it's it doesn't really matter yeah. what happens. If if Gino decides to step up in the pocket, he just keeps backing up, backing up, waiting because he knows I'm coming across. But if he steps up, that linebacker takes me. Gino just has to beat that middle linebacker that's right there, like mm -hmm. Pancake and Homer, to be able to beat him to the end zone. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. so Tyler, I want to ask you this because you made you said something a second ago. You said Gino could have thrown it towards the NFL, but he throws it towards the back of the end zone. How do you know where he's gonna throw it? I mean, it depends on how it looks whenever we practice it. You know, every time you get ready to go against a certain team. Every team plays red zone defense differently. So there's times where he might have to be able to throw a bullet pass to be able to get it there. There's times where he might be able to lob the ball up and get it there. But it's all kind of depending on how the defense plays. Mm -hmm. And, bro, you have mastered this toe drag. How do you know when it's time for me to catch the ball, but I have this limited space where I got to drag my feet? Because if I don't drag my feet – get both toes in, it will be an incomplete pass. How do you know when you're in that position on the football field? Uh, some of it is awareness, bro. Like, I've played punt return, i play kick return, so when the ball is up in the air and they tell you at kickoff return, don't bring it out if it's past, you know, five yards deep, you got to be able to have an idea in your head where you are in the end zone before you catch it. So mm -hmm. that way you know, all right, I catch it, I take a knee, or I can be able to catch it on a run and bring it out. Mm -hmm. When you have people punting you the ball and you have people that's running, you know, full speed trying to be able to hit you, you got to be able to look up, but also look down, kind of have a feel yeah. on time. And if you should fair catch it or if you have time to be able to catch it and run. So it's the same thing with me being able to run across. So even though I see the ball up in the air, I have like awareness around me. 
kind of like how close I am, all that different type of stuff. But it also comes with practice. Like there's times I might run a deep cross or a curl, more so mm -hmm. not a curl, but like a comeback. And you're just practicing naturally, just catching it, dragging your toe, even when you're not even close to out of bounds. Yeah. So here we go right here. It's teach tape. This is teach tape. You right here, you running, balls in the air. You got the awareness. And right now, talk to me. At that moment, you just got to get both feet in. <laughs> Simple as that. It's either go back to the huddle and we get a field goal, <laughs> field goal. Or, you know, you guys did all that work. And sometimes you just got to be able to practice those catches because those catches ain't easy, especially trying to be able to put your foot in. But just being mm -hmm. able, once you know that you dragged that foot, then you just got to be able to make sure that you, you know, embrace it as you go to the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, I see you do stuff like this. A lot of twelves and Seahawks fans. I mean, we this is about to be going on year nine of seeing you do this all the time, <laughs> right, fam? Um, you get no respect across this league. You low key the most underrated receiver in the game. Now we say it all the time. KJ has told me that. Do you feel like you don't get no respect sometimes? I mean, always. <laughs> but I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, that's just the cards I was given. Why do you mm. think that? But, but, but my question is, is why do you think you don't get the respect? I have an I have an idea. Yeah. I mean, I feel like if I was being honest, I don't get the respect because when you look at me as a player, you would think that there's nothing that stands out. So like looking at this, you'd be like, bro, look at his swag. <laughs> <Like>, <laughs> So, so do, when you look do at, do you have swag? I just, I just line up and go. <laughs> just, just give me what I'm gonna wear and I'm gonna go play. Like, yeah. so when you're looking at that, you like, well, he don't dress like what you would think a receiver might dress like. Then all of a sudden, you're looking at, well, what makes him good? Well, when you're talking about releases, people already have in their head who they like when it comes to releases. Mm -hmm. When you talk about people that know how to catch the ball. They like how people catch. They look at people that run routes and they like, bro, look how look how his hips are. Look how he, he's smooth when he does this, this, and this. So then when it comes to me, I mean, I'm just a football player. Mm. So like you tell me what you want me to do. You want me a kickoff return? All right, I'll be a kickoff returner. Mm. You want me a punt return? I'll do that. You want me to play a slot? Mm. I'll do that. So whatever it is that they give me, I play at a high level, but there's nothing to the people outside that stands out that would give people enough to be able to say he's this type of receiver, he's that type of receiver. So instead of me being able to get credit, they use underrated because mm. that's the highest ceiling that I could ever have. Because then once you start trying to mention me in the conversations, they say, oh, no, 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 no. Like yeah. we said he was underrated. That's we didn't so we say can't put him up was, here. We didn't say he was in this category. So like when we talk about how as athletes, we want respect, we want respect. Who and where do we want the respect to even come from? I mean, of course you want the respect to come from the people that are watching, but the more and more that you play, like, as you know, a lot of that stuff comes, number one, within yourself, mm. and number two, within, like, your community, within your family, your friends, like, the people back home, because they respect you. They know how much you've worked. They've seen you defy the odds. They've seen you time in and time out, whether it was with a gruesome injury or not, yeah. you being able to overcome every obstacle that stands in your way. But, you know, at the same time, you don't get the same opportunities that other receivers get. You know, when you get yeah. drafted, you come into situations and everybody's situation plays out different. You get the chance to be the number one. Mm -hmm. You get the chance to be the number two. You get a chance to get 150, 160 balls right off the top where other people got to be able to wait their turn. Yeah. And so there's a lot of stuff that goes into being able to have a chance to be that receiver. And, you know, like for us, you know, we share targets. And so we learn how to play off of one another. And we learn how to play with one another than being able to play against one another mm -hmm. because you need people to be able to play with each other in order to be great. So, I mean, it's either do you want to win a Super Bowl or do you want to be statistical? Yeah. And it's hard to be statistical and get all these amazing stats and win the Super Bowl because then it's all about me at times. So, I mean, it just kind of – it's a lot of correlation that goes within Cause, it. Because, like, I've, there's been plenty of games where I've seen, like, you don't even get a target till the third quarter, beginning of the fourth. You telling me that you worked <laughs> all this time, did all this practice, took care of your body, did this, did that, 
And when the game is going, you not like, hey, Gina, what's what's up, partner? Like, I'm, I'm out here too. That you telling me that they don't cross your mind. I mean, everybody got that competitive nature to where you want the ball. You know what I mean? But the biggest thing that I tell myself, and this is where you got to have that self-talk and you got to be mentally strong is you tell yourself, hey, man, like, don't lash out. Because if you lash out and then you get your opportunity and you don't and you don't mm-hmm. maximize it, <laughs> then what? Yeah. You did all that hooting and hollering and you didn't catch the ball. So then what I tell myself is, hey, bro, be ready because when that opportunity comes, we got to be able to run with it. Yeah. And so then what happens? We play the Saints. I don't get the ball the first quarter. I'm not getting the ball in the second quarter. Then all of a sudden, we got 35 seconds left. Then mm-hmm. I catch a slant. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay. But then what happens after that? Then I catch a touchdown. Mm-hmm. Then what happens after that? Then I start being able to get targets. And so if I didn't maximize that slant, who knows what would have happened? Mm-hmm. And so you always got to be able to be ready because, yeah, we all want the ball because we all know we can – change the game at any type of moment but we we have a numerous amount of players who can be able to change the game at a numerous amount of uh you know at, at any time any yeah. point so you got to be able to stay ready otherwise it's going to be next man up i think from a fan's perspective okay look i've never had the opportunity to do what you guys have done at a high level but from a fan's standpoint the guys that we see that are really good at this game usually amount to some type of emotion. Like, ooh, he a dog. Ooh, you see how they, after Mm -hmm. the touchdown, you see the celebration, all of those things, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, KJ and Tyler, the two of you, I would say when it comes to swag, I don't know if they got it. (laughs) We agree on that, right? No swag. I can can, can attest to that. (laughs) But now I need you to do me a favor, though, because... While you might not show the emotion, I want to know what are you saying in your mind then? If you're not expressing to us what you're saying, what are you saying in your mind? Are you saying like, damn, Gino, man, I was open. You didn't see me? Like, what do you, I want to know, help us out because there's someone that could use this information that's like, yeah, I'm just like you, Tyler. But what are you saying inside internally? So let me, you got let me take this. Let me you take got this. it. Listen, G, I played 11 years in the NFL okay. at a very high level. Yes, you did. Zero all pros. Mm. I snuck into the Pro Bowl, top 100 only one time in my NFL career. But like Tyler just said a while ago, when I stepped on that football field, when I made those plays, when I put in that film study, I thought I was the baddest mother sucker on that football field. I knew that. Did it come from ESPN? Did it come from CBS? Did it come from who else? Nope. But I knew within myself how special KJ Wright was. Did I want it from other people? Hell yeah, I did. When you looked at the tape, when you turn on that tape, you saw who number 50 was. Mm. The real, like, what's Ugo saying? The real, the real, the real always wins. The real ones know who KJ Wright is. And so Mm. that's what kept me going. Like, man, you a bad dude. You don't need nobody else telling you what you can and can't do on this football. So what you're trying to say is, is what you guys are saying inside is, is you guys are saying, I'm going to show y'all. Okay. I lived that (laughs) since high school. (laughs) My coach in high school said, I don't see you being um, a top division one player. You may be a mid-major guy. This is my head coach telling me this. Mm. I'm going to show you. Mm. In college, no SEC. Oh, I'm going to show you. Mm. Come on, I, I live that, and I, that's my story. That's his story. I gotta prove you wrong. That's what you got you me saying, sweating Tyler. right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's funny being able to listen to what KJ says because I mean that's that's really what it is. I think I think for me though, you know, people might think I don't have that dog in me. They might think I don't have that that competitive edge or thing. But the thing is, I know how to be able to utilize it and to maximize my abilities. There's a lot of people that go up there and they they hype. They got that dog, but they they forgot <laughs> what they supposed to be doing. <laughs> they forgot yeah. their job. You run like a chicken and, with his head cut off. Yeah, so like for me it's like <laughs> I don't want to go out there and have that dog, but I lost my skill set. Mm-hmm. So I got to be able to manage and understand that, but then you got to look at who you playing against. There's going to be some people I'm going to be talking trash to because I know that gets them out of their game. 
You talk or trash? I know it depends who I'm going against. <laughs> I know I know how to play when I talk trash, just like I know how to play when I'm hurt. What you be saying? It don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just telling you, like, what I've learned is you have to learn how to be able to play in all circumstances. Mm -hmm. Just like God tells us to be thankful in all circumstances, I also look at it in my life, you got to learn how to play in all circumstances. If you only know how to play when you're 100%, then you're only a 100% type of player. Mm -hmm. But you got to know how to play when you're 70%. You got to know how you play when you're dealing with mental stuff. You got to know how you're playing when you're nervous, when, when, you, when you ain't studied. I've played when I didn't study, just like I played when I studied. And I still know how to be able to meet myself and play at a high level. Mm -hmm. When I dropped the ball, when we played the Giants, I wasn't feeling sorry for myself. I was just talking to myself and saying, all right, you dropped it. You ain't even drop it. It hit your face mask. All right, things ain't going right. You fumbled. All right, so what you going to do? Because when I work out, I train by myself. I don't train with people. The reason why I don't train with people is because when you train with people, you train at a higher level. But whenever it's you and your back is against the wall and nobody's there to help you, who's going to help you? You. If you never train with yourself, you ain't going to have that self-talk. You're not going to have that self-motivation. You ain't going to be able to get up on yourself because you need people to say, come on, bro, I got you, I got mm -hmm. you. No, I don't need nobody. <clears throat> I got me. So when I go out there, I'm always talking to myself. The reason why I'm talking to myself is because I got a plan. I know who I'm going against. I know what I don't have time to have that dog and let everybody see it because I gotta understand, okay, second down, I know what this corner is doing. I know what I know what the coverage is. I know how this linebacker plays. I know how I want to run this route against somebody. Then not only that, I'm gonna go talk to the coach and be like, hey, bro, DK got somebody on this route. I see it. So yeah. it, I ain't got time to be able to show people I got that dog <laughs> in me or that aggressive mentality yeah. in me because I, I've already studied the game and played the game before we even played. So, so like for me, if I'm getting caught up in like, yeah, I might, man, I ain't got the ball yet, but you know what? I got to stay in it because guess what? It's stuff that I'm seeing that I can go tell Gino. It's stuff that I'm seeing that I can go let like whoever know because I see the game in a different lens than everybody else sees it. I see it as a fan. I see it as a player. I go sit by myself. I go look at the, at the little Microsoft tablet to see what's going on because I got to be able to play it out. All right. I studied getting ready for the game. Now I got to study on the first drive. Now I got to study on the second drive. They didn't do it how we thought they were going to do it. But I see how the corner's playing me. I see how the safety's playing me. I see they doubling DK. Okay, this is my day to scramble. Okay, I see that they don't want us to scramble. This is my day to run routes. I'm not about to give you every part of me in a game. Yeah. Some people I won't give releases to because I don't need to. I just need to focus on winning out of my break. Other people I'll give releases to because I know I have to beat them off the line to create that separation. So it really just depends on what the game plan is for me going into it. And let the church say amen. <laughs> <Woo>! Amen. <laughs> Hold on. Hold up, G. Hold up. Tyler, Tyler, Tyler. Oh, I ain't never heard Tyler taking the church Tyler, like Tyler, that. Tyler. <laughs> I hope I hope you don't mind us going to this space we're about to go into. Oh, I have no choice. <laughs> it's your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but bro, you you said it. Like, you've been very vulnerable about your the 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 mental space that that you were in throughout your NFL career, um, the anxiety attacks, the the mental battles, the mental hurdles, bro. Can you tell me how do you play at this very high level going on nine years, and how you dealt with that mental side but still performed on the football field? <laughs> I mean, in order to have that, you gotta have that dog, because you can't give up. I mean, you got these thoughts, you, you're dealing with situations, things that don't go your way, people that do stuff to try to make you um, look bad and then they play victim, all this different type of stuff. And you got to be able to be strong enough to, number one, for me, I trust God. I trust my faith. I know everything works out for the good. Mm -hmm. But you also understand faith without works is dead. Amen. So you got to be able to fight and you got to be able to know that every day is going to be a battle. And like I said, there was times when I went out there, yeah, I was depressed. I was dealing with so much stuff just going on. But guess what? That ain't no excuse. I still got to go win. I still mm -hmm. got to be able to take care of this. And if I got to learn how to play with all this baggage, I'm going to play at a high level and I'm going to learn how to play at a high level. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that I'm going to beat myself up because day one I didn't. But I'm going to learn how to be able to play at a high level while I'm thinking about all this stuff that's going on. Mm -hmm. That's why I said it's so important to be able to learn how to play in all circumstances because now you're not nervous going into a game. Mm -hmm. I know what it's like going into a game where I'm dropping passes. I know what it's like going into a game when nobody can stop me. 
I know what it's like going into a game and I'm limping. I know what it's like going into a game and then I break my leg and then I got to go to the hospital. I know what that training looks like. I know what that training looks like when I got to wake up every day at six to go to treatment. I know what it's like not to go to treatment. Mm -hmm. So about time we get ready for a game, I'm like, bro, I already got you. It doesn't matter how you play. I know your defense. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it, so you look at philosophies. How does this coach teach? If I'm watching KJ, I'm looking at how KJ play. I'm looking at KJ's feet. I'm looking at KJ's hands. I'm looking at KJ's eyes. I'm looking at everything that he looks at. And if I know people that know him, I might be reaching out to them and asking. Mm -hmm. Because I, I don't, I'm i not looking for, I'm not just looking for the scheme, but after I'm looking at that, then I'm looking at what are you showing me consistently? It might, it might be in college. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I might go far back to college. I might Ooh. go first year. <laughs> I'm just looking at what is it that you're showing me that's consistent? And then when I'm going against people that switch it up, I'm like, okay, I'm not gonna worry about you. I'm gonna I'm focus on me this week. Right. I'm gonna use your strengths against you. I'm gonna use your weaknesses against you. It's really just, what do you wanna do to be able to bring out this type of corner you going against this week? And then that's what I do. So, well, since we talking about uh, corners and opposition that you go against, uh, would you mind sharing maybe some of the top corners that you've ever had to go against? Give them their flowers right here. Maybe top three corners, top five, whatever. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of good corners that's out there. I think, like, for me, the best one that I've ever gone against was Sherm. And, you know, I say that not just because I went against him when he was at San Fran, but I went against him every single day at practice because of the side that I lined up on. So regardless of if I beat him in one-on-ones or if I beat him on the play, whether it was team or seven on, you couldn't use that move for another week. Or two weeks yep. because was he was like, yep, I know. So like for me going against Sherm, it was more of that mental battle of like, okay, let's get some more like tricks in our bag. You you find different ways to be creative. And once you become creative, then you start to be able to not only play off of field, but play off of the skill set mm -hmm. of who you're going against. So you're going against a physical corner, you know how to you know how you want to attack. What him. kind of corner is Sherm? Uh, I mean, Sherm is more smart. of a smart, it depends on if he's pressing, if he's off, if he's off. He's a really great re, um, person when it comes to the route concepts. You got to remember, Sherm played receiver. Like, look at Tariq Willen, played receiver. Really good at understanding concepts. Really good at understanding, are you the first option or are you the fourth option? He's he. Yes, he has the speed. Yes, he has the size. But... He also knows what it's like to be able to play receiver. Yeah. So some people they they look at splits, but splits don't matter all the time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes splits can be able to make you overthink things, and then we got you. Mm -hmm. And bro, speaking of DBs, um, at your wedding you had one guy in particular that was in it, a groomsman, that was Quandre Diggs. Talk about y'all relationship, bro, and what is it about y'all two that really brought y'all together and just made y'all best friends to this day. Well, I think the biggest thing with me and Quandre is like we're so used to being able to get overlooked. Sometimes it's a blessing. You know what I mean? Because, yeah, everybody wants their flowers. Everybody wants to be talked about. But the thing that we don't ever hear about people say is that when you get talked about the most, you have these expectations that have no limits. And so it doesn't matter how great you are, because at some point you could have been better. It's almost mm -hmm. like being a first rounder. If you're a first rounder, you can almost never live up to the hype of what being a first rounder is supposed to be mm. because you say, ah, you're supposed to do that. Mm. But then what happens when, you know, you're drafted third round and then Quandre's drafted, what, fifth or sixth round? Mm -hmm. Then what happens when you play at a high level? They say, oh. So mm. even though you're underrated, yep. you're you're more so seen. Your, your value starts to become more appreciated. People start to understand, like, who's that kid? Like, he's in his rookie deal. Then all of a sudden, like, what happens? Quandre goes from nickel. Then, you know, you're talking about him playing corner. Then he goes to safety, and now his value is out of this world. So now he comes to Seattle. Now, all of a sudden, it's like finding somebody out of relationship. And you like, ooh. <laughs> because, because, sometimes, because sometimes, like, the value isn't maximized or the value yeah. isn't seen the same. So now when you see somebody, you can maximize that person's value this much more because mm -hmm. of the plans that you have with that person. Mm -hmm. And so like sometimes, you know, when you get drafted early in the first round, like your value starts now, mm -hmm. but nobody knows if you're really ready 
for what's to come because you got all these expectations, everything's here. But now what happens? We become more valued as we get older. And as we get older, we've already had a couple of years mm -hmm. under our belt to understand how not only to handle being seen, but we've also learned how not to be seen. Mm -hmm. So how do you help Jackson Smith and Jigba with that very thing that you talked about, considering he was drafted in the first round and considering before that young man has taken a snap, mm -hmm. he already has these high expectations. Mm -hmm. Obviously what he did in the Rose Bowl <laughs> in front of the world when he had 300 yards receiving and all them touchdowns. How do you help Jackson Smith and Jigba with this very topic? You just be there for him. I mean, that's that's all you could do is just be there for him and meet him where he's at. Mm -hmm. You don't want to go in and just feel like you got to say all this stuff right off the bat. Like, you got to be able to, number one, get to know a person. You got to be able to talk to him, see what he's like, see what he likes to do, how he sees the game, and then just figure out how you can be able to slowly help. Mm. Because sometimes, like, you know, when you come in, not all of us won't help right away. Mm -hmm. And so you want people to be able to see your value and see what you bring and not tell you that you need to do this in order to be better, but see how you can both be able to help each other be great. Like, bro, what's, what's up with that? Why do some guys come in and not want help right away? Because I've seen that, too. Like you approach a guy and they like, hey, bro, I got it. What's up with that? I would say I would say this. The reason why it's hard to get help when you come from college to the league, and this is just in general, is because especially if you have people that's been in the league before, mm -hmm. they tell you, hey, man, watch out, because not everybody got your best interest. That's true. Not everybody's going to tell you ah. the right plays. Not everybody's going to be on be on board for that's you to true. be great that's because true. you taking food off another family's plate. Mm. You mm. you coming in, that mean you know, with you entering, somebody got to exit. Mm. And so there there's a lot of things that come into play because we coming from, man, college was so fun. We we had so many friends. We was out there balling. Now I'm living out my dream, but to another person, this is their career. Yeah. And so they like, bro, this is my job. This is what I do. <laughs> like, wow. so so for you coming in, you're almost like, ooh, this turns into survivor's remorse. Like, <laughs> I, I got to figure this out on my own because bro. if I run this route that he tell me to run and it's wrong, who going to get yelled at? Me. And I can say, oh, but he, but then it's like, what does that look like? Now you turn into a snitch. Bro, I had to do that same exact wow. thing. Same exact thing. You can see, obviously, when a team draft a guy in your position in the first round, all right, you know, so, you know, something. And at the same time, I had to be that guy for Jordan. I got to share with you what I know. I got to teach you how I got to where I got, even though I got a wife and three kids, and I'm possibly out, the, out this door. It's the circle of life. Ooh, that's got to be hard. And Gee, the person, it's, it's the circle of life. The Ooh. person that did that the most that I've seen with my own eyes just do it consistently was Sherm. Mm -hmm. I go out there and practice. Sherm is with people before practice, after practice. And you can sit there and say, like, bro, they not going to make the team. And he don't care. He wants yeah. you to be able to be great. He wants you to be able to ball out because if it ain't in Seattle, it's going to be somewhere mm -hmm. else. And... Being able to have someone like Sherm to be able to take people in. Like, I've seen Sherm literally stay an hour or two after practice, not even on the field. We talking about after we shower and everything, talking to people about, like, just a numerous amount of things, whether it's being your own agent, where we talking about investing and doing all that different stuff. He's having conversations with everybody. Mm -hmm. And what that does is when you have somebody like that, it makes you want to change the atmosphere around your whole entire team. So now when new guys come in, you like, hey, man, look, I'm going to help you out. If you beat me out, you beat me out. Like like Sherm said, if you good enough to beat me out, then you beat me out, man yep. to man. Ooh. But I'm not going to let you beat me out. I'm going to give you everything you need, but you still got to beat me out. Yep. So when you have that mentality, it changes everything because now there's nothing that I'm going to withhold from you. Mm. But when you're coming into the league, every guy comes into different situations. People look at it like, man, we cool until you a threat. <laughs> <laughs> and you, and, and you got to be able to understand how to maneuver between all those things yeah, at a right. young age 
as you're learning how to be able to be a pro. <laughs> All right. But before we get away from the young man, Jackson Smith and Jake, but I, you know, by society, he was a roommate with my sons at Ohio State. And that's why I thought he was good. What makes, can you explain to us what makes him good? Man, I think the dude is just smooth. Like you watch him run routes, real smooth at running routes. Like a lot of things that you try to teach a receiver, like whether it's in college or in the league, it's almost second nature. You you run an out route or you run an in route and a DB plays it good and he's breaking on it, he's already working down on the angle. Don't even have to teach it. Like you'll you'll listen to coaches be like, hey man, you gotta shave that angle down. Cause that DB, he don't you don't have to tell him that. He's already gonna shave that angle down. And I think just being able to watch him play, there's a lot of great things that he does just off of feel that you can't teach. Mm -hmm. And when you have that, like in your game, the things that you can be able to teach just allows you to maximize yeah. every ounce of ability that he can be able to bring. Yeah. And, and we seen it yesterday. We seen him do some of the things that's like, okay, oh, he made this move. Like, okay, he ran this route. Oh, he did it that way. And so there's a lot of different ways that he's gonna be able to help us out. And, you know, we just want him to be him and just to be able to play like he's been playing. All right, man. And now let's get to it. You're nine. You're not getting any younger. You don't got a Super Bowl on your resume. When you look at this football team, one, do y'all have enough that it takes to get to the Super Bowl? And two, what is it really going to take for y'all to get to the playoffs? Make that move and, you know, to continue and obviously get to that Super Bowl. What is it going to really take? Uh, one of the things that I like that Pete does is he breaks everything in quarters. Mm -hmm. So we talk about the first quarter, the second quarter, the third, the fourth, when you're talking about a length of 16 to 18 games. Mm -hmm. I think for us, I think, you know, obviously everybody says we got the team that we need. We got the players. We just got to be able to stay healthy. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, for us, I think the biggest thing is you got to take care of business where you are today. And all we got right now is preseason. And so how great can y'all be in preseason? That's all you can be. We can't mm -hmm. even get to the Super Bowl because maybe the Super Bowl ain't there for us. Maybe it is. But you can't just focus on one thing yeah. and you Not can't be able to focus on the yeah. preseason. Mm -hmm. Because the preseason is, if you just standing on the sideline and and you like, well, sh I'm a starter, I ain't got to play. You missing out on reading defenses. Mm -hmm. You missing out on being able to understand that this kid might be the kid you line up against in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And you already missed a chance to be able to scout this kid and he played right in front of you. You got a chance to be able to get closer to your teammates, being able to give them advice, being able to help them. All that stuff plays a part in being able to be a Super Bowl caliber team. Why? Because that player starts to understand early on that he could trust you. That mm -hmm. player understands early on that he he knows how you speak to people. So now he can be able to take your advice. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's hard to talk to players. They'd be like, come on, G. You got to make that play. You're like, hey, bro, who you talking to like that? That should have been discussed in the preseason. Ah, That should have been mm -hmm. discussed at camp. Ah. This is where you learn how to understand who your teammates are. Not only who they are as a football player, but who they are off the football field. Once that season comes along, now you're figuring out how can we gel. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said Muzz need to go to OTAs. <laughs> real, real quick, though. I, I, I'll tell you something that I just witnessed right now. I'm an energy guy. People that watch the show, y'all know that. You were sitting there talking, and you were giving that answer to KJ's question. And it feels like after KJ asked you, and you started giving the answer, KJ, you sat back and you was like, you knew it. It's like all you guys have been listening to Pete oh, so yes. long that you guys give Pete answers. <laughs> Pete answers. Once he talked about the break it up in quarters, you, you can't look at the Super Bowl. You knew where this was going, didn't you? I knew where it was going. Maybe the but fans I mean, did, and I already kind of knew. But I mean, it's the it's the truth, though. Like when you really look at life, you can look at where you want to go, but once you get to where you want to go, what happens with a lot of people? Bro, then they want to get to somewhere bro. else and they never get to appreciate how they got to where they got to. Bro, this is a better example. Let's say I, I weigh 300 pounds and I want to weigh 200 pounds. Mugs just look at the 200 
before they even get to two ninety nine. In order to get the two hundred, you gotta get the two ninety nine. That's the same. Does that make sense? No. It, oh, I mean, preach it. Yeah, 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 I mean, look, all right, y'all, y'all on fire. I'm passing yeah. y'all. And that's ball. what I'm saying. It makes a lot of sense steps. because I can sit here and say, man, I want to get to a thousand yards again. But like, am I gonna look every single day to figure out when and how I'm gonna get to a thousand yards, or am I gonna learn how to be thankful for every catch I have? Am I gonna be thankful for every rep I get? Because mm. when you know what it's like to be hurt and you gotta miss a game or you miss the season, now I was saying, what happens? Mm. You're not worried about what you didn't accomplish. You're trying to get back on the field. Right. So why mm. is it that all these situations have to happen in order for you to get back to the present? Mm. If you learn Ooh. how to be able to just enjoy the present for what it is. Yes, everybody's goal is the Super Bowl, but our goal is just to be able to be better today. Because if we could be better today, then guess what? We can be able to be better when that time comes around. Mm. But everybody's waiting to get to this point. And I'm telling you, when you get to this point, then you win. Now what happens? Everybody want to win again. <laughs> because you, you what happens? Anything, you know anything about that, KJ? Uh, just a little well, bit. What happens? You're <laughs> never satisfied. But when you just learn how to feed yourself little by little, then you'll be able to fully grasp the Super Bowl and be like, not only did we prepare for this, mm. but we prepared for this day one. We treated day one like a Super Bowl practice. We treated day one like a Super Bowl meeting. We mm. treated day one relationships as, as Super Bowl relationships. So now we are not making this moment as big as it really is. We won the Super Bowl when we when we got on the Seahawks. We won the Super Bowl when Pete decided to become a coach. We won the Super Bowl when players decided to say, I want to play on this team. <laughs> like, when you start looking at it, make Super Bowl decisions every single day. So when you get to the Super Bowl, it's just another game. Damn. Hey, this mug Whoa. right here. It's hey, just, this mug woo. right here. Uh, okay. You was on fire right there, but... It was an observation in the first preseason game against the Vikings. And I want to give a shout out to all of the game day presentation folks. Uh, Daniel, Lee, Maddie, shout out to the VP, Jeff Richards. But there was something that happened during the game yesterday. And it was a part where the fans had to choose between Tyler Lockett, the real estate agent, and <laughs> Tyler Lockett, the football player. And then they was like, so they point to the real estate agent and the fans were like, ah, oh, that's cool. And then when he got to the football player, yeah. And then when it was done, they pan over to you. Here you are right there. And you was looking at it. Did you like that segment? Oh, for sure. I mean, it seems like the, first of all, the game day presentation yesterday was good. You guys was really into that. It seems a little different. Like I never knew that you guys liked what's going on oh, on the screen. Oh, we love it. Oh yeah, Do we you? love it. We love it. They used to have this thing like, Nate, what's KJ's favorite movie, favorite car, favorite food? All this used to pop up. Dan does a really good job in just that whole presentation. Dan Ardino, shout out. You're really good. And, um, but yeah, bro. Hey. How about the kissing cam? Oh. No, you know the what? The kissing cam, it was dope. It was you know, a little rated R. <laughs> you know what I didn't like? What you didn't like? The Barbie? Be careful with the comparing people stuff. I saw that. That could get a little nah, sticky. No, nah, I like that. That could get a little sticky. The compare, did you like the Tyler? Did you like the comparing stuff? I thought they did a good job. They could get <laughs> sticky, man. Because I'm like, get their feelings hurt. I they, mean, but it's life. Whose feelings? Y'all feelings aren't get, hurt get hurt out hurt. there? They, folks are going to come and enjoy the game. Don't be comparing me. Let's say somebody put up an Oprah Winfrey and you put up an Oprah Winfrey what if, looking like a. What if, what if they put up a Kobe Bryant and then they pan over to KJ Wright? I'm cool. I could take that. But what if you put up a big fat Santa Claus? You put up a big fat white dude on there. But if you paid the tickets to go to the game, then you know what you're getting yourself into. Say less. You know what you're getting <laughs> yourself into. There's a chance you might look like Barbie, there's a chance you might look like Ken. <laughs> All right. But, um, hey, bro. Thank you for your time, man. No problem. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time, bro. Um, just the insight, bro. Just the domination you had over these eight years, bro. You go go for five straight. No, you go first of all, you get one yard, and then you'll get a thousand <laughs> yards. You get one yard, then you'll get a thousand yards. Can and I, so can I ask one more before you go? Just one more question. Let's go. And one more. Um, can you help us understand DK Metcalf? <laughs> like <laughs> everything that you was talking about with like the past and stuff, D DK, like. He shows his emotions and stuff like that, right? 
So does that make him a better player? And like, explain DK Metcalf to us. I mean, <laughs> I just feel like what you see is what you get. Okay. He go out there. It don't matter if it's a pass. It don't matter if it's a block. You know what you're going to get. You're going to get an aggressive man <laughs> running at you, and you're going to get tested every single play. And when you see he runs a route and you think you got him and you're going to knock him out, you get knocked out. So if, if you're talking about DK, you got to come correct. I tell you, I knew DK was for real. It was his rookie year. Mm -hmm. OTAs. He called a pass on Austin Calitro. And you, whenever you see a linebacker and receiver going at it, you think uh, the receiver going back down. Like, I'm the linebacker. I'm the big dog. Mm -hmm. This man hovered over Calitro. Yeah. Yeah. What's up? I was like, oh, this dude for real. As a rookie. I was like, mm -hmm. oh, he he not the one to be messed with. Not going to back down from nothing. Yeah, so. Does that does that help the wide receiver room when he's that way? Like, it's like, oh, okay. I mean, everybody like to have that big bro that's like, that's the big homie. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I mean, that's the, and, and the thing about the mentality is the mentality matches. It just looks different. Hey, gee, next week, I start my show. Oh, that's right. Hey. The Seattle Sports Station, Brock and Salt. Every Wednesday, Brock and Saw KJ all day is going to be on Cairo. Tune in at 8 o'clock. I'll see y'all next week. Wait, real quick before you go. Why do you even go do a show with them? You like, like them, dude? I like them. Salk's super cool. Brock cool, too. But Salk, we're in person. So we be talking during commercial break, talking about stuff. Saying stuff off the record that we wouldn't dare say on record. So A lot of people like time. think Salk's a certain way. But actually, Mike Salk's like... He's a really nice dude. Really nice dude. I thought he was a certain way. I didn't like him when I first met him on Twitter, but the dude's super cool. I love a lot of the, the some of the play. Sometimes, like in the past, like some of the players didn't like him either. If they don't know, which understand. Matter of fact, let me just say this: I didn't like him even to his face. But he's actually a good dude. He's cool. You know, so. He's actually a cool dude. And then also, you can catch me on uh, Kyra Radio ninety seven point three FM nine a.m. to twelve every single day, Monday through Friday. Tyler. You can catch me live and serve real estate. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, real hey, estate. Hey, and he played football too on Sundays. <laughs> what, what you like doing better, real estate or football? Both. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank y'all for joining us once again for another episode. Make sure y'all like, subscribe. We need to get to 100,000 followers. So do me a favor. Send this to your whole context. Thank y'all for joining us. And make sure if you go do something, please do it the right way. <laughs>